Hello, and welcome to the Week in Politics, episode two with Larry. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Or, um... Sure. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a volunteer uh, with Indivisible East Bay and uh, some other uh, activist groups. And I got my start in politics in the mid 2000s, kind of in the blogging world. I uh, went to the first couple of year, uh, yearly COS uh, conventions, which are now called That Roost Nation, and been you know volunteering for campaigns and spent a year uh, as a science and technology policy fellow in Sacramento, and yeah, got involved through politics that way. Cool. Um, so I my my first question is um, about um, obviously the the topic of this episode is the future of the Republican Party. Um, and my first question is um, where you see the Republican Party going, um, kind of on, on the topic. Um, yeah, it's a huge question. <laughs> of course, massively important for the country. Um, I think where it's going is mostly what you've seen. And maybe uh, one of the most recent signs of that was when the Republican Party uh, uh, campaign for the, the 20, uh, 2020 election came up with their platform, they didn't. They just recycled the 2016 platform, I believe word for word, and it made their platform reelect Donald Trump, and that's it. Um, what they can't say is that uh, Donald Trump is uh, giving life to nearly full-throated uh, white supremacism and, uh, and uh, basically a, a, a American version of fascism. Uh, and that has the wide approval of most of the Republican party. Now, granted, there are a number of people who have left the Republican party um, and there are some people who are unhappy about the tone of things, but most people, uh, from what I understand from the polling are, are um, supportive of, of what's going on. So, um, yeah. We, we we are recording this a few days after um, Christmas Day, um, with um, which had a white suicide bomber blow up an RV in, in Nashville, Tennessee, and and um, may as well have been stoked by um, by Trump's very um, very vile hatred of of um, many in this country. Um, yeah. And so I um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, well, and, and that brings to mind, too, that this is not new. It was not as um, explicit in the past couple de decades, and it was more explicit before that, um, you know, uh, 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 up through the civil rights era and beyond as well. But the, what, that, what you, you mentioned about the news brings to mind the Timothy McVeigh bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building which mm -hmm. um, was an anti-government and racist motivated act of terrorism and mass destruction. Um, so this, these patterns are not new, uh, it's just how they're expressed and whether they're stronger or weaker that's in question here. And another thing I'd bring up of the most recent news is that we just experienced the entire country revolving around uh, uh, Trump's rejection and then finally a uh, resignation to signing the um, the corona, uh, coronavirus epidemic um, pandemic relief bill, where you basically had the whole country waiting around for one white dude's feelings and uh, millions of people suffering in terms of not getting the aid they need because of that. Um, and yet to, to so many Americans, that's still acceptable and plenty within the Republican party. So, um, and you do see the split between the, uh, the, the Trump tantrum. And also it's not just that it's real, it's him attempting to uh, enlist the Republican Party one more time for him to become dictator uh, mm -hmm. and hopefully failing, but we'll see. There's still a few days left here. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's I, I guess that's where I'd go with it, is that, that it's all kind of of a piece. Yeah, we've, we've definitely seen, I think, um, since, um, since Trump stoked the racial tensions with the whole birtherism, um, the claims in in 2015 and 2016 i think um it's the republican party has has veered quite far to the right um i mean i don't think that's a surprise to to many but um well what's funny is who it was a surprise to us to how far so you look at somebody like my favorite example favorite is jeff sessions um so here's a guy who's a virulent white supremacist and a, and a lifelong project of this stuff um 
and I believe couldn't get confirmed as a judge because of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then Trump appoints him as attorney general. And he, even he, you know, he recused himself from the, um, from the uh, Mueller oversight. Mm -hmm. And so here's a guy, or no, he, he appointed, yeah, he recused himself from the Mueller oversight. And so here's a guy whose project it would be to support, uh, you know, a racist and fascist movement like Trump's, but he still believed a little bit in the, in the, in some fragment of the American ideal in kind of this funny way. And, uh, and didn't, either realized or wasn't on board for a just full-blown open open fascism um which is kind of hilarious in a way um and then of course he's gone because he wasn't on board with that and uh mm -hmm. and, and trump pushed all those people out of the administration so there is that shift within the party and you do see uh the likelihood that that mcconnell is essentially discarding trump he's gotten what he wanted out of him there's an intercept article about this uh, out today this um, i need to check into but uh we had some indications of this uh, in October as well, when um, when Trump uh, he when he uh, there was something to do with the the COVID relief bill then that he messed up, and it was likely at McConnell's urging. Um, so uh, so yeah, they've they've it, it, so far as we can tell, the establishment of the Republican Party is has gotten what they wanted out of Trump. They've gotten their judges, which is McConnell's biggest project. Um, and uh, and they're ready to, to capitalize on that game and discard the uh, the somewhat unpredictable um, tyrant, which is you know we narrowly are escaping hopefully um, the fate of many other countries where the establishment thought they could play along with the tyrant and use that person uh, and and appease that person for power and and political gain um, and profit. But then the tyrant becomes too powerful, and there's nothing to do but submit to him. And you see this in in Trump's demands for loyalty oaths and things like that of his appointees and and all that. But um, so hopefully we're escaping that. But it is still a, a little bit of a risk, and we were in great peril, much greater peril, up until the election itself. Mm -hmm. I, I'm um, I'm heartened to see that we have not um, come any closer to um, the the plight of many of the Eastern European countries um, with their increasing authoritarian um, authoritarianism. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to quickly touch on, um, I know it, um, our former, now former Attorney General William Barr just um, put in his resignation. It's not entirely clear whether um, he was fired or he resigned, um, but um, it's, I, I with your mention of Jeff Sessions, um, former Attorney General Jeff Sessions, I think it's it's interesting to note that um, yet even the um, the the law enforcement um, of the government has, has very um, is is not um, continuing onward with Trump's um, pathological um, actions and and um, yeah distancing themselves from from that. I think it's um that that brings to mind a lot of things um one is that a general point that um the law is only what people uphold and act upon and so we talk about the rule of law and the constitution being in effect or not and that kind of thing and it's really just a matter of it, it is important that the ideals are there and there's that there's a culture of support for uh justice and fairness and 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 everything else but um but also like if it, we'll see uh, there's you know with the with the nomination of biden as the as the democratic nominee a lot of the push for um uh real accountability from people especially like elizabeth warren uh has diminished and that is scary to me we you know we really need to have you know uh not do what obama did in 2009 when he came in and with um with massive financial fraud and with Bush administration torture and war crimes. They said, uh, look forward, not backward, which has been catastrophic for the country and helped lead, lead, lead to today. Um, and that you can trace back to the Democrats' failure to nail the um, the uh, the Reagan administration on Iran Contra, and uh, perhaps most seminally on on um, Ford's pardon of Nixon, which was massively unpopular at the time, as I understand. Um, 
and but then since hailed as this great peacemaking moment but what it may well have been is as rick perlstein talks about is a turning away from a maturing of the country and facing the the sins of the past and the realities of the present mm -hmm. that are derived from those um, mm -hmm. and i think it's a very apt description i think with um obama had so much difficulty in in 2009 with the um republican senate um and and house and now we're we might have the same um conclusion if if um democrats do not win both seats in, in georgia right. um it biden is going to have a very tough road ahead um, um not being able to get um congressional approval for for many issues that are, are vitally important to, to the american people i think um, right and uh apropos of what we were talking about with um which you know, will the, the the Trump racist domineering faction overtake everything in the Republican Party? And uh, I mean, it, 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 that that is allied with McConnell in almost all regards, but not in a few. And so when you see you know, heavy indications from Biden, I mean, kind of the whole point of nominating Biden over Sanders or Warren or somebody like that was to maintain the established status quo, kind of turn back the clock to 2015, which was what led us here, but they won't, you know, they won't uh, admit to that. Um, and and Biden overtly says, "I want to work with the Republicans. There are all these reasonable Republicans who I can't name because they'll get in trouble, but they're ready to work with me on day one." All this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, but McConnell's still there, and he overtly said when Obama was inaugurated and Biden was there as the VP uh, that. McConnell would make uh, he would, he would do everything to make Obama a one-term president, and that was his goal above and beyond democracy or America's well-being or anything like that. And that's way down, way down the list. Um, in fact, mm. he's perfectly happy wrecking the country as has been proven. So, uh, so yeah, those signs are you know gut-wrenching and uh, difficult to deal with. Uh, I do think, as a matter of political strategy, there are alternatives. Um, we want to talk about the Democratic Party's future a little bit. Um, we can talk about how there are things like a more confrontational uh, approach uh, of, of calling out Republicans for the full damage that they're doing and the uh, motivations behind it and not excusing it as like, oh, Congress is dysfunctional or both sides need to come together. Like, well, the other side is basically thrown in with fascism all the way up to supposed moderate Lindsey Graham. So um, we don't want to be compromising with them. And what we've learned from World War II and other instances is that appeasement uh, can lead to some very bad places. Um, and that, um, yeah, so uh, I, I, let me go back to what you were asking about. Uh, what was the next part, part you wanted to talk about? Um, yeah, you, um, you're mentioning that reminded me of, um, we, we've, um, now had the unmasking of uh, Miles Taylor, who um, I think a year ago, who or a few years ago, who wrote the um, New York Times piece um, from inside the White House, and we're all um, wondering who who the uh, who the anonymous was, um, and um, and I think he he had an interesting um, interview um, with uh, I forgot who it was, but. Um, he he says that people officials inside the White House do not want to speak out um, about what's going on, and and because they don't, they feel if they get fired, then Trump's just going to appoint um, some someone more even more loyal to him. Um, and so I think um, that's yeah, that was obviously a big challenge. I think for the past year in which we've seen. Um, so many terrible things. Um, yeah, there's the tragedy of this year, but there's always going to be some of that dynamic at play. I mean, that's politics. It's it's a little bit like um, mafia or a gang uh, of dynamics played out um, in a, in a legalized setting. <laughs> um, but in yeah. in some, you know, it depends on how what people are willing to do and what their moral standards are and individual people's um, values and beliefs. So. It brings to mind a, a little bit of a, a historical tidbit from, I forget if it was Khrushchev, um, when he first came in and, uh, and uh, someone, would, someone in the Politburo or somewhere was, was saying, well, like, why don't we address the 
why didn't anybody speak up before about the abuses of the previous premier? Mm -hmm. And uh, Khrushchev said, like, who said that? And I looked around, who said mm -hmm. that? Like, nobody raised their hand. And he's like, ah, mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> so yeah, all these anonymous people talking about their Trump administration experiences, like, okay, and actually that, that it falls into that dynamic as well. It's a lack of personal courage um, and values but i'd also say and it's enabling um i'd also say i really want to uh elevate the voice more of um and again i'm sorry i forget who this was but it was a new york times editorial about two weeks ago by a former doj attorney emma I believe. emma or emma someone yeah exactly and she talked mm -hmm. about how we wanted to stay and try to hold the line mm -hmm. and in the end, actually, I think it wasn't worth it. And that mm -hmm. is a huge lesson and something you people would know if they read Masha Jessen in The New Yorker, they listen to Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa on Gaslit Nation, people who studied, like you say, Eastern European dictatorships and dictatorships around the world. Um, these dynamics are very familiar. And in fact, in a lot of cases, it's the same people. Like it really is the case that the Russian mafia, um, you know, is, is uh, you know, goes hand in hand with Putin's activities. Putin is, uh, by some gauges, the richest man on the planet, runs this country as a, as a mafia state. So, um, and those people pushed Trump and who knows what he owes them. He certainly owes a bunch of, um, a bunch of people monetarily to the tune of millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 400 million, 400 some odd million um, coming, coming due next year. Yeah, and think yeah. of your favorite mob movie or cop show. That's going to put the heat on somebody. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. And, and so, like, why are Republicans on board with this? And I think it does come back to the, to the, to the white supremacism and the need for dominance and the submission of others. Um, mm -hmm. There was that quote um, from Abraham Lincoln toward the end of his Cooper Union address where he talks about, uh, you know, it, it's not enough to agree with the pro-slavery Southerner. You have to agree. It's not enough to, to agree to disagree with them. You have to agree with them and show them that you agree with them. And uh, they won't tolerate the, the difference. It is a little bit of like a challenge to their belief system, a blasphemy, if you were, um, mm -hmm. because the belief system of white supremacism is fraudulent, obviously. Uh, and based on a lifetime of self-delusion, uh, they have to support that. And any questioning of that is going to cause uncomfortable uh, feelings and lots more. Um, and there's, you know, just to say, there, like we've seen with the awakening of a lot of people with the Black Lives Matter um, demonstrations, especially this year, um, and uh, slogans like abolish the, the police or even mm -hmm. defund the police, which are a real mm -hmm. gut check to people. Like there's latent white supremacism in many Americans, um, probably most, uh, mm -hmm. mostly latent, hopefully, uh, some, uh, especially among the Republican party, not so latent. Um, but uh, but it is a case that, you know, that is, you, you know, you look at um, movies from 20 years ago and, and a lot of stuff is pretty cringy, well, 30 years ago, especially, but uh, it's, and that's still, you know, what a lot of people have grown up with, hopefully less so now. Um, but it is bringing the conflict out in the open. And the point I was trying to get to was for um, those with privilege um, mm -hmm. to improve the country and to, if we were to have a, um, a, uh, a, a Republican party that would be reasonable to work with, it would be after uh, some sort of national healing. Um, we need the confrontation. And to sweep it all under the rug would be to you know, like to not do um, the denazification program. Mm -hmm. it, it, and that's the way, that's what America has done to date is we have swept it under the rug. We've addressed it in fits and starts. Um, and then the, the you even see the Democratic Party leadership shying away from the overt direct challenge to the, ba the fundamental bases of supremacist power and things like that. I mean, we talk, they'll talk a good game about it, but when it comes to materially changing that dynamic that's where and it, and it comes down to people personally too you see it in the nimbyism uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's common throughout the country um mm -hmm. and uh, and so even in the most lefty places 
that'll become an issue. Um, and so you're, what you're, we're asking people to do to improve the country and when we get people to talk about privilege and things is to willingly cede power that has been unfairly gained over history. And that is a lot to ask of people. People get upset about that. <laughs> um, and uh, there's an interesting parallel to climate change too. Um, I think it was, mm. what was his name, um, Chris Hedges has talked about this, um, where he compares in some ways some parallels between climate change dealing with it and dealing with slavery, where with the Civil War, it took a, a massive bloody struggle to, to take the, the supposed property of mm -hmm. slave owners away. Um, and they're, they're the whole framework of belief that they had built up around that. Um, and that with climate, the, the, some of the racial element is gone. You still see oppression of, of some royal rich countries that has huge racial um, lines. And you see it here in terms of places like Richmond, California, where they're mm -hmm. often downwind of uh, oil refinery fumes from Chevron and the mm -hmm. struggles in that community. So it, it's still pervasive. But it, and so that's why we need to address it. But we're asking people to give up those unfair advantages. Um, and a lot of people don't want to subconsciously because they haven't addressed it or they don't want to because it feels it makes them feel uncomfortable. Or in the case of the, the right wing, it's very conscious and holding a lot of people's, uh, a lot of people's uh, political views. I, I do think it's an interesting parallel you make. Um, I, I'm one of my, my big interests is in how um, to combat climate change and um, especially how can municipal governments um, accomplish that goal. Um, here in Berkeley, we have um, a, our mayor is a, one of the climate mayors um, in the nation, um, a group of over 400 um, mayors who are, who are tackling this issue. Um, and I, I've been reading in, in um, Bloomberg uh, City Lab, they have um, these articles on, on how cities can, can tackle the um, most pertinent issues. Um, they are saying that cities need to be at the forefront of this issue, um, that, that cities are the first ones who, who bear the, the brunt. Um, and, and so they need to, um, for, I guess first there needs to be um, intense um, and immense um, financial capital, um, financial aid from, from the federal government, which has not occurred in the past four years. Um, so yeah, I, I know it, it could be a, a whole entirely different uh, episode here, but. Um, yeah, it, it does. I mean, it does speak to some core dynamics though, because you think, see things like with the pandemic relief bill, where there's the argument over how much money to send people. And there is an overall project of conservatives saying those damn undeserving people, and by that they often mean minorities, um, shouldn't get this money. Um, it is literally a transfer of wealth, um, which is part of what, uh, what uh, class and racial justice demands um, over time. The, uh, and, but you also see an ideological project including on the Democratic Party to not make it a recurring payment um, other than for unemployment benefits expansion, that's there, but that's a mean tested thing. So that's kind of a neoliberal matter where we say like, you gotta jump through these hoops, you have to be deserving in order to get this, mm -hmm. this money. Um, when, uh, when oftentimes that, you know, that, that reinforces existing, I mean, that's called establishment for a reason, it reinforces existing power structures to refrain from doing that or to refrain from giving uh, universal programs mm -hmm. uh, to say that the value of every human life is, is equal. Um, and uh, and to, to your point about cities and the economy too, I wanna bring in uh, Naomi Klein's perspective from This Changes Everything and, and her other work. Mm -hmm. It really is the case that uh, to address climate, you need to address racial justice and class. There you go, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, absolutely. I do. You recommend uh, uh, this changes everything, though, in terms of a, a, a expansion upon that idea. It's, it is a very different work. Um, the shock doctrine is is was seminal and very important in terms of understanding. And you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a uh, there's there's a little bit of a a, a lead into the shock doctrine I'd recommend too, and that's um, uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. I forget the author's name. Mm. There there may have been some inflated claims in that book, but the overall point is in terms of the the kind of the, the 
the international corporations in, mm -hmm. in play here and the kind of um, how they uh, how they seek out people to rationalize and justify the the, the profiteering that they do and when that fails um, then then that's when uh, things become more violent <laughs> so yeah the I, I think um the the interesting part of that book for me was um the, i mean the very beginning where where she um she starts out talking about the um the hurricane katrina and and corporations taking advantage of displaced peoples and um and so that that's i mean and capitalism but um exactly. which is still the unquestioned uh well uh by the leadership uh, unquestioned ideology of the country <laughs> and mm -hmm. you see things yeah. like uh with things like defund the police and then also with things like um, um universal health care uh the argument within the democratic party about uh, about that ideology mm -hmm. so in fact you also saw it with uh the after the 2016 loss somebody directly quote quote uh, questioning speaker pelosi um you know about socialism and her response was, we're capitalists, and that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see about that. <laughs> All right. I, as, a, as a progressive myself, I, I'm, um, I, I've been, these, these past four years especially, uh, trying to find footing in, in how, um, how really progressive to go, um, or, or, or do, do I, speak out against the actions of um pelosi and the uh the democratic brass or or um or support it um I, we've seen them there have been many um claims that that democrat that the democratic leadership has has um has been in the pockets of of capital um, capitalist um corporations and um and i think that's that that's a very apt, um, <laughs> maybe some would say um, analysis, but I mean. And, and uncomfortable thing to bring up. I, I mean, I got to say probably the number one impediment to my work within uh, mainstream democratic activist groups is when I question party leadership. And uh, mm -hmm. it makes people pretty angry. Um, for example, last year in March, when um, Speaker Pelosi came out openly against impeachment, um, I, all last year, I was an uh, avid impeachment activist, and uh, we uh, we saw support for it just die for about six weeks after that. Um, mm -hmm. I try to bring it up when people get real mad. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, so yeah, there is that, and it's not to say that they're evil or something like that. There are. It's a matter of what the priorities are and what considerations are at play. Um, and yeah, um, so that is a whole other topic. <laughs> yeah, I know the the feature of the Democratic Party might might be all another episode. Um, before we stray too far into that, um, I, I I do want to bring it back to the the future of the Republican Party, and and um, I think I, I I'd like to start with um our first episode was on the the lawsuits, um, and I think that's sort of where it all starts. Um, we Trump is now, um, Trump and his state Republican allies are, are at 63 um, loss, uh, 63 losses and, and one win as of yeah. this morning, um, I believe. And so when, when you have the, the president, um, the executive questioning um, uh, a legal and, and just fair election, um, this country has, has already strayed too far into, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not even the the beginning of of this crazy insane administration um but um yeah and, and just to yeah, say what, what are your thoughts uh the if it was closer they would have stolen it i think um mm -hmm. and they already did once in 2000 <laughs> mm -hmm. uh yeah you know it, it's it's unclear how the florida vote would have come out i've seen some people find that it probably still um, Bush would have won and other other pretty intensive studies by journalists show that depending on which way you counted it then Gore would have won and in a little way and you know and just to make clear as we saw the electoral college um, the winner of the electoral college in 2016 and in 2020 was 306 electoral votes 
but that was a swing of uh, of of five million votes difference uh, for Biden, and and that was uh, Clinton winning by three million votes. So we don't mm-hmm. have a democracy. Like it, it's it is important to get that that through that like we do have this American ideal and that is another thing that's inculcated kind of like there may be a generational generational thing where aversion to socialism is inculcated and maybe less so now uh, with people who are growing up now I'm not sure but um but in terms of like the view of America as an upstanding democracy and the constitution is great and everything about it is perfect and the founders knew what they were doing in all regards well they did but they they made a lot of compromises and uh and there's a lot of you know slavery was enshrined in the constitution at the time mm-hmm. uh you had the, the whole dynamic between the states and now you know there are things they couldn't foresee but like modern instant communications and the massive disparity between states populations and all these things um but there's plenty they did foresee and just you know didn't do you know they aren't perfect people so in fact they're <laughs> they when when america was founded it was not a democracy only white land-owning men could vote uh and the rest of the people didn't have a say, and that's not a democracy. And so we talk about America as this great democracy from 1789 or 1776. Uh, it wasn't a democracy yet, um, and really wasn't until uh, we, uh, until the civil rights era. Uh, and even then, now we're seeing retrenchment with Republican moves against um, against uh, against minorities voting and Democrats voting in general. Um, and I would say about. Uh, you were saying a minute ago about um, the the lawsuits. That is uh, also a loyalty test. I mean, it's like how far will you go? Uh, mm-hmm. And you see Barr. Ha- had it been winnable, I-, I think he would have seen Barr stay and fight it out. He was pretty committed to a totalitarian project. Um, has been since the since the first Bush era when he was involved in loads of pardons of awful criminals. Then. Um, so, uh, and, and just to say in terms of establishment too, that the fact that he got confirmed so easily and uh, the Republicans uh, shoved him through, the Democrats barely raised a peep. Uh, that was a moment when I was scared because I was like, mm-hmm. oh, that may be for all the marbles. Um, mm-hmm. Because this guy who's known history is seen as uh, an upstanding figure, um, then we're in deep trouble. <laughs> and we were, mm-hmm. um, it's just that it wasn't, we were, we were lucky and everybody's efforts for get out the vote were successful on the presidential side. Uh, uh, we had, we well, were not so successful on the, on the, on the legislative side, but, uh, but we were lucky that the, the, you know, a few tens of thousands of votes different in a few key swing states and we might be in a lot different place today and for the foreseeable future of the country, so. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I know it's it's difficult to hypothesize about some unstable um, groups in this country, but um, I I just want to uh, take a moment to to discuss um, or, or ask you what you think um, might happen in the next next four years. Um, we, we've uh, seen right. <laughs> Trump um, say that he might um, he might run again in twenty four. Um, whether that's on uh, another party or another party ticket or, or, or the Republican ticket again. Um, and we, we've definitely seen him also. There have been rumors that he might start a, a TV channel, um, TV news station, um, which, which is which difficult in itself. But. Which was apparently his goal when he first started running. He, he, mm-hmm. had, he, had, he had thought about, he had attempted runs for president before. So it's not like... He didn't want to be president and be the you know the top guy in the world or whatever. Um, but also he didn't want the job per se. Uh, and uh, and it, there are you know some reports that he he was using it as a launching pad for a media empire, which is honestly a smart thing to do if you're otherwise you know, a wreck in terms mm-hmm. of a business person. <laughs> that was what he was good at. Uh, you know he be NBC really um, made him with The Apprentice. Uh, mm-hmm. And if it weren't for that, we wouldn't be in this spot either. Um, but uh, but then you saw that when he, and it's just a funny aside, when he actually won the election, um, mm-hmm. the he was shocked for about 18 hours. Uh, mm-hmm. you can, mm-hmm. he, if you look back at video of when he, Obama first toured him around uh, after the election, uh, it was clear. And he, there was actually a report on to go back to the kind of playing with power dynamics of the mm-hmm. establishment Republican leaders, 
there was a report from the Young Turks um, live from election night 2016 in the um, mm. in uh, at uh, Trump campaign HQ, I believe, and there were all of the the MAGA guys out front uh, cheering and hooting it up, and in the back were the big money guys, and they mm. were like, uh oh, what have we done? <laughs> so there is that. I mean, there is there is some you know we're seeing it with McConnell and things like that. There's establishment cutting off of, of the Trump thing, but that but that is also they you see their the Republicans fear of Trump where they they just won't defy him. And if you do, you're out of the party. It's not like you can still be a Republican and defy Trump. You see D Justin Amash get pushed out. I mean, I guess Mitt Romney did, and he's still a Republican. So there is that. Um, but uh, so it doesn't entirely hold. But you know that is it. I mean, it is loyal it's fealty to the leader, and it's all part of the package. Um, so where does that go? I don't know, man. It's it's going to be wild. I I, <laughs> it's, I I I guess I mean, seventy four million people voted for for Trump. Um, yeah. We're close to seventy four million, and and um, that's probably not going to change much in the future. Um, and so with those 24 million people, what do they do in, in 24? I mean, um, yeah. are they going to, um, with a more, uh, with, a, with a democratic um, executive, do they push back in the next four years? Very, um, very, very tough attacks. Do we, yeah. do we see more, um, you know, attacks from the right or? Well, we will see more attacks from the right. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, um, you see things like the Proud Boys, which may be fizzling somewhat, it's hard to tell. Um, you mm -hmm. see things, but definitely like white supremacist groups and the three percenter types. There may be some discouragement from losing um, because, you know, Trump's all about being a winner and he ain't a winner. So, uh, <laughs> um, but, there, but, but a lot of the overt white supremacism has been uncorked and that's going to take a public reckoning and confrontation like i was saying to put back in the bottle and not a papering over and uh, let's all come together and get along which is the danger with the biden administration and so it is i mean <laughs> we already know right like obama ran, and biden already ran this experiment for the first six years of their administration uh, and yet here we are poised to do it all over again. And it's like a horror movie sequel or something. <laughs> uh, do you, I, I guess my, the real question is like, do you see um, Republicans like, like uh, Lindsey Graham and, and uh, Mitch McConnell, um, I mean, whether he is majority, whether he stays majority leader or, or becomes minority leader, um, really pushing um, other Republicans to defy in Congress um, on, on certain issues. Um, yeah, I mean, once Trump's not the president, then it's a lot easier to tell him to piss off. And I think, <laughs> I, think the, uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot of his popularity will wane. You did see with Bush a different dynamic where he was popular because of 9-11. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he had he obviously did uh, advance some general white supremacist uh, moves, uh, just in, in, mm -hmm. in the old school general Republican sense, um, mm -hmm. but uh, over as over like this. Um, and so, but his popularity, it was interesting. It spiked after 9-11 to like 90%, and then it was like a steady line. And it, it crossed about exactly 50% of the 2004 election. So if it was like a popularity versus political capital exchange, they timed it perfectly <laughs> so that he could get a second term. Um, and was down in like in the 20s or something like that toward the end of his administration. But now mm -hmm. compared to Trump, everybody's like, oh, he was all right, including a lot of Democrats, um, mm -hmm. including the Obamas, unfortunately, <laughs> have like rehabilitated him. And the dude is a war criminal, you know, in, in a lot of ways he did mm -hmm. more damage than Trump, like between the response Response to 9-11 and the destruction of Iraq and Afghanistan mm -hmm. and other countries around the world, the losses for the democracy and the terrorist blowback from that, uh, the, um, the, the, fail, you know, the, the refusal to address climate change, um, that may be the lowest, la those uh, may be the lowest lasting effects of all. And that may be, you know, that, that, that may be more damaging. I feel like 
if there was a hinge election in American history in, in recent times where things were close and they changed, sure, 2016 was a big one. 2020 is obviously like mm -hmm. we stopped the damage. Let's try to try to repair now. But 2000 was a was a pretty big one because it was so close. I mean, it was literally like a few hundred votes in Florida. Mm -hmm. and that was after, of course, mass voter suppression. And then just to say real quick, that Supreme Court um, decision was completely fraudulent. Uh, the basis for it, mm -hmm. as I understand, was the irreparable harm to the Bush administration, but he wasn't president yet. Mm. So uh, uh, that was, if there's the movie called Recount that goes through this, if you can stand some Kevin Spacey, I know that sounds so great, but uh, but it, it, other than the fact that they omit Fox News' role, that, that's a very thorough retelling of, of that that um, legal point. Um, mm. But this, yeah, the Supreme Court was, it was a fiat rule to the point where in the mm. ruling, they said this ruling can't be used as precedent for other rulings, which just gives away the game. Um, mm. So the, the continued, in terms of institutional stuff, I am worried about the continued legitimacy of the Supreme Court. And it's something we haven't talked about as much as we should, and we don't talk about enough in democratic circles. But um, that was where uh, Lindsey Graham and other people, you know, as the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and then um, Senator Feinstein's deference to him is so massively damaging. Because here we have uh, an institution that has been supporting um, oppressive and white supremacist uh, moves, including getting rid of the um, large chunks of the Voting Rights Act to the point that it allows mm -hmm. a lot of this voter suppression and, and the, the continued white male dominance of our political sphere. Um, and so, uh, and so when the, like even Schumer was on board with the project to delegitimize Barrett during the hearings. Mm -hmm. um, but now she's confirmed and partly due to Feinstein's doing um, or not doing, uh, she's seen as a legitimate justice. The court is seen as legitimate. When 2000 should have sealed the deal as the court not being this, um, this uh, uh, body of justice at all. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and they, there are plenty of, of course, legitimate rulings and, and very learned arguments and everything like that. But when push comes, and, and then there are things like when um, the Muslim travel ban came up. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time around, uh, the Chief Justice said, basically, like, I can't do this because you haven't given me a fig leaf ban. You know, mm -hmm. like, it's just too blatant and we have to have some kind of framework like I'll do it but we have to have some kind of whatever argument you come up come up with that says this isn't racist and come back to us with that and they did mm -hmm. and then he rubber stamped it so it is the case that I am worried that the continued um, elevation of the Supreme Court as some kind of body of justice is, is dangerous for our democracy we should be seeing it as an undemocratic and tyrannical force in the country um, that should be completely overhauled um, I mean, it, it would take a, uh, you can add justices is the, the direct fix. Um, the, mm -hmm. All it takes is a law passed by Congress and signed by the president to do that. Um, that would potentially rehabilitate the institution itself, but it is still an undemocratic and um, not necessarily the, the greatest way to run a government. Um, and so in the long run, I hope we can get to some state of constitutional amendment or reform um, where we address these issues because a lot of these structures are buried in the constitution, which is still our so-called social contract, which supposedly we all agree to abide by. And, um, but I, you know, you see a lot of Republicans say they uphold the constitution, but don't uphold it. And they're abrogating the social contract, um, which we haven't signed, you know, we, there hasn't been an amendment passed in a long time. So the people alive today, a lot of them, you know, there, there hasn't been any, I and mean, for most of us, there hasn't been any means to address all, uh, the structural basis for a lot of our problems. Um, whereas in a lot of other countries and places, um, they address those. You see that in California here too, even with a democratic supermajority, um, mm -hmm. we have a very messed up state constitution. Uh, the original structure was done when the state was, I don't know, one tenth as population it is, it is now. And it was done in a rush in like the 1880s or something. Uh, and it's been amended up the wazoo in that case. So in that case, we have been reforming it, but the structure of it is a mess. So all these kind of unaddressed problems where we don't um, deal with things comprehensively and we don't address the past as directly as we could, um, you know, hopefully we can do more of that. And that, that goes for um, reckoning with our racial past, of course, um, both uh, the, the biggest issues, of course, being uh, uh, slavery, 
and of, of um, Africans and African Americans and of um, the, uh, the genocide against uh, Native American peoples and various other permutations of that to the point where today you have Republicans, some of them saying that the internment of Japanese during World War II is actually uh, understandable. And it is understandable, it is not justifiable yeah. um, in terms of what happened there. So yeah, <laughs> trying to put that all together is a little difficult, but um, in terms of the future of the Republican party, uh, it's not good <laughs> for the country mm -hmm. or for us, um, hopefully not for themselves. Uh, hopefully with the loss, a lot of these movements do lose some steam. Um, and they're, you know, a little silver lining you, know, you don't want to give fascists or white supremacists more of a voice, um, but hopefully we can address those issues more directly now, uh, mm. and not uh, tiptoe around them. And and we, you know, something I, I realized, like I was talking to somebody else in uh, Indivisible in a different part of the country, and we were talking about our own conversations with our families and how long we've avoided, you know, if somebody says something somewhat racist or uses an outdated expression that, that had, you know, racial overtones or bigoted mm -hmm. overtones, um, that we just let it slide in the, in the interest of comedy mm -hmm. and, uh, and getting along and things like that. And it's not a matter, like, sure, there are some people, a lot of people have disowned. You've seen that across the country with the Trump administration. All, a lot mm -hmm. of people who have had to cut off contact with family members or friends mm -hmm. uh, over mm -hmm. the, the just unbridgeable differences and the the cult-like move of the of the Trump base, um, but to, uh, for a lot of us, I hope people engage in that project of talking to people too, like the people who are reachable. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear. I mean, I don't think everybody is reachable. I think some people are too far gone. We should recognize that we can't all get along, um, and that there are people we have to fight. Um, but that we do um, persuade people. That we do. Uh, it's not a matter of compromising and meeting in the middle. I think we on the left should have the courage of our convictions um, with mm -hmm. humility, but but have that courage and to, and to talk to people on a one to one basis and 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 sit with the discomfort and it be ex, be ex, explicit about sitting with that discomfort and saying, like, where did this expression come from and uh, and how is it not OK now? And yes, mm -hmm. I know it's it's it means um, changing the way we think a little bit, but that's that's what it takes to, to move forward. I, I do find that interesting. I have a few family members who did vote for Trump in, in 2016, huh. I think. Um, and so it's it's interesting having those conversations. And um, I do think a lot of those um, prejudices come out of come out of ignorance. Um, yeah. Well, um, I think that's a good place to, to wrap up our discussion. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for tuning into The Week in Politics, um, episode two. Um, feature the Republican Party.